They can be noisy, they don't bring in a lot of money, and of course, they sting. So what's all the buzz about when it comes to beekeeping? And why would someone like Betty Dotson want to spend her retirement this way? You have a little bit of extra time. Many retirees are still good and healthy. Um, it's just something that uh, maybe their grandparents did, their parents did, and they remember what it was like. Also, they're reading more about the importance they have in their society for food production. Even though it's a sign of activity, the buzz of a beehive can also be peaceful to an outside observer. Dotson says some beekeepers are making their farms available to those seeking calm. They're using their bees uh, as places of meditation and uh, healing, and the sound is amazing. Dotson is especially excited that her bees are producing autumn olive honey, the clearest type of honey she's ever harvested. She sells some of her honey as a side business, but she considers herself a hobbyist and isn't in it for the money. Neither is Grover Holland, a beekeeper from North Carolina who moved to Dickinson County to be closer to his adult daughters. I'm going to take everything that I make off of it and give it to feed the hungry. Holland's father also raised bees. He began helping out at age 10 and has remained passionate about it. I just love working with bees. Watch them work. I like to watch them and see what's going on with them. And I've learned a lot over the years. I can pretty much tell when they're out of, queen, out of a queen, even without going in. Beekeeping can also be beneficial for retirees, especially if they're new to it. Raising bees fosters engagement and continuous learning. There are many bee clubs in local communities helping to provide social engagement with like-minded citizens. Individual hives are only a few feet tall, so retirees can keep only one or a few in their backyard. It's also been a popular endeavor for military veterans. Programs such as Hives for Heroes provide training and other resources for interested veterans. There's also the Honey Bee Initiative for Veterans Empowerment and Support, or HIVES, a pilot program run by the Department of Veterans Affairs Healthcare. It uses beekeeping as a way to manage the overall well-being of some veterans. While many of the beekeepers say they're not afraid of getting stung, not all bees are happy to have their hives opened up. Ron Stilwell has been involved in the Richmond Bee Club for years. His apiary in Henrico County has four hives, and he uses a smoker to distract the bee when he lifts the lid. Bees communicate with pheromones, which are smells, scents. It's their primary means of communication, and when you when you smoke them, it masks that pheromone and they get confused. And they also realize that smoke, and where there's smoke, there may be fire, right? So they tend to go down into the box because they have to get ready to flee, perhaps. They also fill themselves up with honey because they may have to flee. Sort of like if your house is on fire, you might be tempted to grab a few things. Well, they're doing the same thing, right? And when they're distracted like that, and when they uh, fill up on honey, they tend to be less reactive. By less reactive, he means less likely to sting you. Stillwell ran a homeless shelter, then earned a degree in theology and was introduced to beekeeping. He eventually became a hospital chaplain until retirement. Here's one that's just packed with pollen. Mm -hmm. It's corbicula, it's the pollen sacs here on those back legs. Mm -hmm collects the pollen, and they bring it home and store it. The U.S. Department of Agriculture notes that pollinators like honeybees are responsible for every three to five bites out of each meal we humans eat. As generous pollinators, they help fruits and vegetables reproduce and grow. They also spur growth in trees and wildflowers. That helps stabilize soil. And of course, trees consume carbon dioxide. There are many programs available for anyone wanting to get started in beekeeping. Virginia Cooperative Extension, the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and many private beekeeping clubs are always glad to help. In Henrico County, Virginia, I'm Burke Moeller reporting. The European honeybee is so important to modern agriculture that the Virginia General Assembly has just declared it to be the official state pollinator. Honeybees came to Virginia with the first Jamestown colonists, and that allowed them to pollinate the non-native fruits and vegetables they brought to the New World, such as apples, potatoes, and peaches. Today, the fruits and vegetables pollinated by honeybees help farmers bring home $116 million in profits, 
as well as another $1 million in honey sales. While backyard beekeepers are important for gardens, many commercial farmers hire full-time beekeepers to move their hives to their farms and orchards. Well, hello and welcome. Today we're in Chesterfield County, Virginia. And we're at the Extension Office and we're here with several master gardeners. We're here with Jerry, Nancy, and Pam. And we're talking about what to do with straw bales, maybe how you can garden with those. It's pretty interesting. They've got a wonderful garden here, more traditional, but right behind us here, they are actually growing lots of things in the straw bales. Um, Pam, tell me about what you're doing, how it started, and maybe some of the advantages of, of growing in straw bales. It's much less complicated, and it's the kind of thing that anybody can do. Okay, I think it could be great for some of the gardeners out there that are trying something because there's a lot of advantages to this, right? Yes, a lot of advantages to this. You don't have to bend down. Right. You don't have to buy lots of soil. You don't have to build the bed. Right. Um, you basically have a bale of straw. Right. And after some conditioning, you plant in that. It sounds great. Can you think of any disadvantages to this process? Well, you can't grow corn. Okay. So not, not everything can be grown. Not everything can okay. be grown, but most everything can be grown. Okay. Um, after two seasons in the garden, two growing seasons in the garden, you can recycle your straw bales. You have to get new straw bales. Okay. But it's very inexpensive compared to putting in a raised garden. Hey, Nancy. Um, Great straw bales here. I noticed this is kind of a nice straw bale. You've got some that are a little decomposed. They get heavy. How do you, is it important to place these early on, kind of know where they need to be? Oh, absolutely. You definitely need to decide where you want your straw bales because once you put them there, it, you're not gonna be able to move them very easily. You said earlier there's something called conditioning that you do. What does that mean? I'm, I'm not familiar with it. Conditioning is a, it's a 12 day process where you treat the straw bale with a high, fast dissolving nitrogen fertilizer okay. and um, and you put about a gallon of water on it. It's a process. Fertilizer and water, next day just water, then the next day fertilizer and water. Okay. And all that's doing is really uh, supercharging the microbes inside the bale to start that decomposition process because this bale will decompose and actually become your soil. Okay. And you know that's happening when you see uh, these mushrooms growing along the bale. Sure. They're coming up because the fungi and all of the, the microbes in here are beginning to do their work. So that's great. Okay. But the other part of that is why you can only get about two years out of a bale because they are constantly now decomposing. So right. you can see here, this is a fairly fresh bale and we have some other bales that are not quite as sharp on sure. their edges. They're sure. a little bit wonky. And they probably feel a little different. They do. This one is, uh, is pretty tight. Okay. Um, you can get your finger down in there, but this is a freshly conditioned bale. Okay. But these bales up here, as you can see, are extremely soft. Um, there's, you can really yeah. get your, your, your um, fingers down in there. Well, Jerry, I know that we've talked about the advantages here, but, mm -hmm. uh, and it sounds great, but tell me, how do you plant in this? What do you normally do? Well, there's a couple of ways to plant a straw bale garden. If you're planting seeds, we have um, garden bean seeds here. Okay. Uh, we put some co mushroom compost on, this, on top of the bale just to have something for the seeds to sit in. And then we just follow the directions on the bag um, if you have a, something you just want to put a little hole in based on the planting instructions. Okay. And then we just drop them in, cover them over. Cover them up. Okay, just like and, you would uh, in, in normal soil. And like we would with any garden, we'll, uh, we won't do it right now, but we'll, we'll water those in. Okay, I noticed you've got some something growing here on the side even of the bale. Yes, uh, you can take advantage of the, uh, the bale along the sides if you especially want to think about the southwest exposure for the sun and not the northeast. Mm -hmm. uh, we have nasturtiums in here now, but we will be putting in squash, watermelons, uh, cantaloupes, uh, anything that uh, some of the um, some of the things some of these bales will use for uh, sweet potatoes, but we'll put some on the top and some uh, the slips on the side. That makes sense. So I see the seeds. What you'd want to do now? How about transplants? Like uh, like this eggplant right here. This eggplant was a, a seed that we started at home that became a seedling, and uh, we it had it was in a three-inch pot. 
uh, just pulled out some of the some of the straw, spread the straw a little bit. This is a a new bale, so it's a little bit more resistant, but it comes right out. Drop in some compost, put the plant in there, water it in, and uh, eventually you have to to uh, support them as they grow. I see you've got a trellis system here. Do you use other trellises besides something like that? Oh yes, if you want to, I can take you over and show you our major trellis system. Okay. So this is a really nice trellis, Jerry. I really like this. We put it up uh, to support three bales. Three, th three bales are nine feet, mm -hmm. so we get a two by four by 10 foot um, bo um, board okay. and attach it up at the top for support. And we can plant tomatoes. Um, down here we have yep. tomatoes planted. Sure. They will, in another two months, will cover this. I see some sweet peas there. Yeah, sweet peas. Up. And then we have cucumbers down here. Okay. So anything, if you're thinking ahead and you know you're planting anything that needs uh, support, this is an excellent trellis support. Uh, we just use anodized wire. It's like 12 gauge. And then I come back through with some uh, twine. for It's good for a year. Well, Jerry, thank you so much for letting us come out here today. I think this uh, straw bale gardening can be really great for most gardeners. I think so, too. We love our straw bale garden and invite people to come out anytime. Well, great. Thank you so much again. Okay. Well, for more information about gardening with straw bales, contact your local county extension office and talk to master gardeners like you've seen here today. For From the Ground Up, I'm Chris Mullins. We'll see you next time. From the Ground Up is presented with the generous advice and assistance of Virginia Cooperative Extension. Visit their website at ext.vt.edu. Hi, I'm Chef Tammy Brawley from the Green Kitchen. Welcome to Heart of the Home. Today I'm going to show you guys how to make a delicious cream of jalapeno soup. And what I love about this recipe is, believe it or not, in the summertime when these things are in season, eat something hot will help you cool off. Um, some people don't believe that, but I certainly do. Um, there's a two-part to this uh, recipe. One is a delicious sauce that we're going to start with first. And you want to actually put your jalapenos on the grill. Um, or on an open flame, which we don't have the open flame here, but you want to get them nice and blackened on the outside, and then you want to skin them and um, take the seeds out, which I've already done there, but I will show you this one. These actually sat overnight, and they're much easier when they cool off to actually skin. I've got a paring knife in front of me, and I'm just going to sit there and scrape all of that blackness off of there. Now, by doing it this way, and you can do this with any peppers. I do it with uh, poblano peppers quite a bit. Um, and then we're going to slide all that skin off. And you notice I'm wearing a glove. That's for safety purposes. Obviously, you wouldn't want to touch your eyes after you take the skin off. So we're going to pull those seeds right out. Now, these are roasted, so it's a little bit different texture, but I'm going to show you the fresh ones in a few moments. But there's a misnomer um, to a certain extent about peppers. They say that the heat comes from the seeds and that you want to take the seeds out. The heat actually comes from the vein that is holding those seeds. That is where your heat is. So we've got three jalapenos in there, and now we're going to just take our cilantro. We only want about three tablespoons. So we're going to put the cilantro in there, and then we're going to add three tablespoons of a hot pepper vinegar. So we're going to turn the food processor on while that's starting. We're going to go ahead and drizzle in um, four tablespoons of olive oil. Don't forget to take the top out like I almost did. Drizzle it in slowly while the uh, food processor is operating. A little trick here with the food processor, if you have one of these, if you put your finger underneath and hold that blade still, rather than trying to dump it out, if you, usually if you don't hold the blade still, the blade follows out behind you, obviously making a mess and can also be dangerous. But if you hold that steady with your finger, then you can pour it into the saucepan while you're holding that blade. It's not going to come out. And then we're going to pop it on a burner, and we're going to let that simmer for about 10 to 15 minutes while we start the rest of our soup. I have melted some butter in a saucepan here. Um, your burner, um, after the butter melts, you want to go ahead and turn that down a little bit. And now we are going to use some chopped onion um, as that's rewarming, and we're going to do some fresh jalapeno peppers. Um, when you've got a whole pepper, one of the things, as I said a moment ago about the sauce, you want to make sure that you do get the seeds and the stems, um, excuse me, and the veins out. This is a fresh one versus a roasted one that you saw a minute ago. Using a little paring knife here, and I'm just going to cut around the, the, uh, the veins and the seeds. Slide those out. Usually, you know, you bang it a little bit and the seeds come out the side as well. 
And I also believe that I probably am using a few too many jalapenos, given I've done this recipe so much. So I'm not going to put all of these in there, but I am going to use all the onion. That was a diced white onion that I had. I'm going to go ahead and add um, probably most of these jalapenos, but I just don't think we need them all. And then the recipe also calls for two large carrots. Well, we're pureeing this recipe, so it doesn't really matter whether they're shredded or small. Um, if it was a large carrot, then yes, I would dice it a little bit, but we got shredded. That's about too large, maybe a little bit more. All right, so now we're going to come back and saute these up a little bit. You know, and recipes are guidelines, as I like to tell people. You know, if you like it really, really spicy, you may want to add the rest of those peppers. Now I'm going to hit it with a little bit of flour. Flour is going to make it um, turn into a soup. It's going to uh, thicken just like a roux or a gravy. Coat your vegetables. Now I'm going to hit it with some chicken stock. I happen to have some homemade chicken stock here. I always save my carcasses and make chicken stock. Great thing to use your Instapots for, by the way. I'm going to go ahead and just start stirring it before I add all of the chicken stock. That will help um, the thickening process go along nicely. And then also, too, I'm going to continue to add, this is about three cups, might be a little bit more. If it's starting to stick to the bottom of the pan, which it might, I would recommend you pull a whisk out. I don't feel any stickiness on the bottom, so I don't think I even need to use the whisk at this point, but I am going to add some more stock. Now, it does call for about three cups, but also, too, I may not need all that. I'm kind of eyeballing it knowing that I'm going to add the cream and I'm going to be pureeing it. And then what's great is that if you hold on to a little bit of stock and it is too thick at the end, you can always come back and thin it out a little bit. All right, that needs to simmer for about 10 minutes, and then we'll finish our soup. We have let our soup simmer for about 10 to 15 minutes. You let the vegetables soften. We had them coated with a little bit of flour. And now we're going to use a hand stick blender to blend that up, puree it. I'm going to move over here. So right into the pot we go with our stick blender. And if you like some consistency to your soup, then you don't have to puree the whole thing. Choice is up to you. I personally like pureeing all of it because I like the creaminess. This is just about ready. You can see I'm leaning the pot a little, and that's just to make sure all those nice, thick, chunky vegetables get under that blade of, this, of the uh, hand stick blender. All right. Now... That is pretty darn good. I do want to come back with some cream. Um, whatever cream you'd like to use, if you have a lactose problem, um, you could certainly use coconut milk if you'd like, or you could use an almond milk, any of those. And we're going to put the cream in there. Let's go ahead and puree that a little bit. And now we're going to add a good size handful of some shredded Monterey Jack cheese. Whatever cheese you want to use, but I certainly would recommend it. I think the recipe calls for about a cup. Well, I, you can see I don't have a measure, but does that look like a cup to you? I think it does. Maybe a little bit more cheese if you'd like, which I certainly do. Come back over here, and we're just going to stir that up until that cheese melts. Shouldn't take very long because the soup is still hot. All right, we're going to plate it now into a nice pretty bowl. If I thought this was too thick, I could certainly come back and add a little bit more chicken stock. This is actually perfect soup consistency. Oh, you can see that cheese. Look at that mess I made. Oh, what a shame. This is actually pretty spicy as it is, and I love it that way, but I'm also a big fan of spice, so I like this sauce that we made there at the beginning. Remember that this is roasted jalapeno peppers and um, cilantro and oil and a hot pepper vinegar. And if you wanted to make this a little spicier as I do, I'm just going to come in and dollop a little bit on top there. Nice little garnish. I could add more cheese if I wanted. I could add some more finely chopped jalapenos. So I've garnished it with some of that delicious jalapeno sauce. And there you have it, a cream of jalapeno soup. Perfect thing to eat in the heat of the summer. It will certainly help keep you cool. I'm Chef Tammy Brawley from The Green Kitchen. Join us next time on Heart of the Home.
Recipes from the heart of the home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafb.com slash recipes, as well as on Chef Tammy Brawley's website at greenkitchenrichmond.com. Peppers are a minor crop for Virginia farmers, but are extremely popular with gardeners and at farmers markets. In 2022, jalapeno peppers and other varieties other than bell peppers were raised on 300 Virginia farms covering 86 acres. Bell, banana, pimento, and cherry peppers are milder varieties raised in Virginia, while cayenne, celestial, and Tabasco peppers are hot. Jalapeno and chili peppers fall into this category. Peppers are native to the Americas. Historians believe chili peppers were grown in present-day Mexico as far back as 3,500 BC. And while consumers consider peppers to be a vegetable, botanists classify them as berries. The most recent Census of Agriculture revealed a growing demographic diversity among Virginia farmers. Entrepreneurship, cultural heritage, and stewardship of the land draw these new producers to the field. We visited several producers to hear their stories. We were out here on the farm with my dad. And from there, he you know, instilled in my brother and I both you know, great work ethic as far as being responsible, uh, being reliable, being dependable, um, understanding uh, nature, understanding, you know, uh, we as, as consumers, you know, we, we take a lot, but do we actually produce, do we give back? While there are more than 1,600 African-American farmers in Virginia, they make up just 2.4 percent of the state's producers, according to the most recent Census of Agriculture. As African-Americans and, and minority farmers, you know, we have to tell our story to understand uh, that we're still here, and we're still farming, you know? We're still here, and farming isn't like it was uh, 40, 50 years ago. You know, we have tractors out here with AC. Uh, we have precision machinery. Uh, we use drone technology on our farming. Uh, I mean, we use a lot of different technologies and agricultural practices that help our farming operation be more profitable and beneficial to the soil, to the land, and the next generations to come. Pierce also teaches agriculture and serves on the Surrey County Board of Supervisors. I'm trying to raise the next generation of farmers. Currently, I have four students that have just recently graduated from Virginia State University, and all four of those students are, have jobs in agriculture. A few counties west of Pierce, Pedro Lopez began farming in 2017 on just nine-tenths of an acre in Brunswick County. From 2017 to 2022, producers of Hispanic origin increased from 845 to 1,026 across Virginia. I used to work in a, like a restaurant. When they bring the cucumber, it was kind of pricey. I asked the man if I raised cucumber, if he would buy. He said yes. So, which I feel happy. And all the restaurant in the area, I ask him, hey, do you using, what you using here? So they say, well, I'm using eggplant, I'm using tomato, I'm using peppers. I say, okay, here we go. Lopez grew up in the Dominican Republic, where his father was a farmer. His knack for growing products not typically found in Virginia has helped him reach Hispanic customers who are excited to find familiar flavors. I went to Full Island and saw the black beans, and I said, you know what, let me, uh, let me buy a bag and see what happens. So I plant the beans, we start harvest by hand, I bring it to the market, probably three, four bushels, put them in there, just like nothing, you know? That beans, it was solid like probably in half an hour, 45 minutes. Everybody was like, yo, man, we got beans here. Virginia State University's Small Farm Outreach Program has been integral to the success of growers like Lopez. He was with me on a bus tour over to the eastern shore of Virginia to the ARAC um, um, research station. And I never will forget, he was looking at the mold that was coming out of a corn cob. And he says, wow, you know, that's a product that I can actually sell back in my home country. Another demographic shift in Virginia agriculture is the growing share of female farmers. The 2022 Census of Agriculture estimates they now represent 37 percent of the state's producers. Peggy Spicer's desire to start Willow Hill Farm began with her father. I would encourage every young woman who is interested in farming, just dive into it. 
Um, it can get expensive. It can turn into a total loss. So the best thing is to start out small, but follow your passion. It will grow. There will be some down days. There, disaster will happen. Uh, but you do have to learn to roll with the punches. You have to see the end goal. Along with more farmers from diverse backgrounds, the number of producers under 25 grew from 2017 to 2022, reaching 1,110. Diaz Tompkins, a student at Virginia Tech, is working to return to his family's farm. For me, I've enjoyed the fact that I'm able to show like, hey, there's other people that exist in this realm. Um, I think when it comes to what's important, I think is having everyone at the table. Um, I think if we look at it from a number standpoint of we need this amount of this people or this amount of this people, I think that's the wrong approach. I think having an approach in who eats here at this table, okay, then you need to be here. Although they hail from different backgrounds, these Virginia farmers share a common passion for agriculture. Reporting from Surrey County, Virginia, I'm Elijah Griles. The most recent Census of Agriculture revealed a growing demographic diversity among Virginia farmers. Entrepreneurship, cultural heritage, and stewardship of the land draw these new producers to the field. We visited several producers to hear their stories. We were out here on the farm with my dad. And from there, he you know, instilled in my brother and I both you know, great work ethic as far as being responsible, uh, being reliable, being dependable, um, understanding uh, nature, understanding, you know, uh, we as, as consumers, you know, we, we take a lot, but do we actually produce? Do we give back? While there are more than 1,600 African-American farmers in Virginia, they make up just 2.4 percent of the state's producers, according to the most recent Census of Agriculture. As African-Americans and, and minority farmers, you know, we have to tell our story to understand uh, that we're still here, and we're still farming, you know? We're still here and farming isn't like it was uh, 40, 50 years ago when you're out here, you know, pretty much what they call back breaking work. You know, we have tractors out here with AC. Uh, we have precision machinery. Uh, we use drone technology on our farming. Uh, I mean, we use a lot of different technologies and agricultural practices that help our farming operation be more profitable and beneficial to the soil, to the land, and the next generations to come. Pierce also teaches agriculture and serves on the Surrey County Board of Supervisors. I'm trying to raise the next generation of farmers. Um, I've been teaching for the past, uh, going on eight years now. And since I have been teaching, I can honestly, honestly say that I have impacted lives of maybe over 100 students. Currently, I have four students that have just recently graduated from Virginia State University. And all four of those students are, have jobs in agriculture. This is me <laughs> planting the seeds in a little kid's mind while I teach, giving them the fertilizer and water they need by giving them the resources, the experiences, the opportunities, and hopefully to see what comes of the, the, the fruit they bear. A few counties west of Pierce, Pedro Lopez began farming in 2017 on just nine-tenths of an acre in Brunswick County. From 2017 to 2022, producers of Hispanic origin increased from 845 to 1,026 across Virginia. I used to work in a, like a restaurant. I remember 